Good morning. There's something about welcoming people while they're just biting into their salads that's a little bit interesting at an event. Um, I, I just want to take a second to say, first of all, we're delighted that you chose to join us for the summit today. And I wanted to give you a little uh, reminder about why Lourdes um, was, um, is the particular place to do this event. So we received specialized accreditation for the business and leadership programs through the International Accreditation of Collegiate Bus Business Educations. Students can pursue at Lourdes undergraduate degrees in accounting, business administration, healthcare administration, human resources, management, marketing, and sports administration. We also, of course, have stellar graduate programs, our master's in business administration, and our master's in organizational leadership. Many local and national companies employ Lord's Business alums. To name a few, some of who are with us this afternoon, Dana, Groupon, AT&T, Owens Corning, Principal Business Enterprises, Fiat Chrysler, Prometica, Mercy Health, uh, PNC uh, and Lazy Boy. The Joe Maglichetti Leadership Summer, Summit offers our region great insight into how business is successfully and ethically conducted. This afternoon's speakers are exemplary executives who provide goods and services to customers throughout the country while contributing to the region's economy. Their words of wisdom will not only benefit the ta talented professionals in this room, but also our large university students who are here today and our local high school students who have been invited to share in this important meeting. So the topic of this afternoon's presentation is business as a noble profession, creating your legacy. And the Lord's business programs and faculty focus on building strong and ethical leaders who will positively impact their workplaces and also the community in the Toledo area. Before I invite our two distinguished speakers to join me on the stage, please enjoy this brief video presentation about the Leadership Summit. What does it mean to create your legacy? To share a smile, show up early and stay late, to raise thoughtful questions and care for humanity and the world, to find innovative solutions, stand up for what's right, be an engaged citizen, develop relationships and work toward a dream, to mentor, enrich the future, show compassion, to walk the walk. Live authentically and ethically to serve others, seek justice, be selfless, caring, to inspire, create a lasting impact, to be inclusive and truthful, to encourage, enlighten, and empower, to create, to leave a footprint on the hearts of others, one person, one day at a time. What are you doing today to create a legacy that will last a lifetime? It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to today's guest speakers. These esteemed professionals are at the helm of successful companies both within Northwest Ohio. Through their leadership style and daily practices, they are creating their legacy instilling in others how to successfully manage a company and how to also be good stewards to their stakeholders, including employees and the larger community around us. Our first speaker is Mr. Chuck Stocking, CEO, co-CEO of Principal Business Enterprises, Inc. He's a manufacturer of innovative and high performance moisture management products Principal Business Enterprises is a family-owned company which was established in 1961 and headquartered in Dunbridge, Ohio. And there's an additional manufacturing facility in the Bowling Green area. PBE, as it is known in the community, 
is recognized as a pioneer and a technology leader in absorbent composite materials. And these are used in healthcare primarily for incontinence and wound care, industrial, environmental, and consumer products. It's a mission driven company that seeks to uplift and to enlighten and to enrich the lives of those it serves, including the company's employees, their associates, their customers, their business partners, and also their community. A native of North Central Illinois, Chuck graduated from Principia College in Elsa, Illinois, and obtained his JD degree from Northwestern University School of Law. Following his law school graduation, he practiced law for several years and served as the vice president and house counsel for General Binding Corporation, which was a public company headquartered in Northbrook, Illinois. Subsequently, he spent a number of years in turnaround consulting practice with a heavy emphasis on strategic planning and execution. Chuck has been involved with principal business enterprises since 1975, but began full-time leadership of the company in 1994. And he's bringing his extensive background as, as he had had in the past in marketing, sales, and operational leadership in manufacturing and service companies to the organization. He has a passion for dramatically improving the quality of life for people who are getting care and also people who are caregivers to those who need care. And he eliminates the waste and um, eliminates the waste in a lot of different areas that is used in healthcare so that we're not wasting anything as we go through that process. Chuck is actively engaged in public service through leadership positions in a wide array of North uh, nonprofit and service organizations. As a Rotarian for over 40 years, 40 years, um, he has been active in Mesa and co founded Partners in Education and the Dove Fund. He is also a trustee on the board of trustees of the Toledo Symphony. He's a member of the 577 Foundation of Perrysburg, the Mental Health Clinic of Wood County, Toledo Community Foundation, Perrysburg Area Historic Museum the First Church of Christ Scientist in Maumee, and the Multi-Faith Council in Northwest Ohio, to which we are very grateful. Thank you. Um, our second speaker is another well-known professional that we're excited about having today. And since January of 2005, Stephen Herzl has served as the president of Herzl Canning Company. Herzl Canning Company is a grower and processor of tomatoes and pasta sauces, salsa, and other innovative tomato products, and sauerkraut. They are located in Northwood, Ohio. I'm sure you've heard of them in Northwood. And they've been in operation under the same ownership since 1923, and is widely recognized for their Dave Fratelli line of retail and food service tomatoes and tomato products that you can find in many grocery stores in our local area. Before joining, Herzl Canning Company is their sales manager in 1992. Stevens served nearly six years in various capacities at FMC Corporation's Food Machinery Group in Fresno, California. He currently sits on the board of directors for Herzl Canning, and he also is in the Bi Business Advisory Council for the Food Science Chair at The Ohio State University. Stephen has served on the Pastoral Council for St. John the 23rd Church, and as a board member of the Toledo Legatus Chapter, his business advisory council for the Eastwood Local Schools, and he also participates on scholarship committees for both Penta County Vocational Schools and the Ohio State University Wood County Alumni Club. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Agriculture from the Ohio State University and a Master's degree in Business Administration from the University of Toledo. So join me in welcoming both of them to the stage, please. I hope you're ready to learn from both of these individuals, and you'll have a chance to ask them questions afterwards. So feel free to uh, start creating those questions. So I think I'll start. Um, you know, there's a danger putting me in a soft chair at this stage of my experience, you know, so if... Uh, Tom Palmer, I expect you to be prompt me if I if I doze off here. You know, especially it's embarrassing in, in the middle of my talk. You know, today. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Steve and I are very honored to be selected for this uh, opportunity and to share with you our experience. 
And <clears throat> I'd like to say, I, while I did not know Joe Maglacetti real well, I remember very dearly when Bill Niehaus and I went to him on behalf of Partners in Education to see if Dana would support one of our activities. And he was the most gracious gentleman that I think maybe perhaps I've ever known. Really awesome guy. So big, big round of applause for Joe Maglacetti. So. <laughs> they asked us to keep our remarks to two hours in length, so if, <laughs> right, Steve? <laughs> so we're going to do our best. I thought uh, Steve and I had some discussion before uh, we uh, came here today and, and about what it means, what a legacy is all about. And we both agreed that the legacy is not ours, but belongs to all of the associates that we work with and belongs to our predecessors. So it's, uh, it's remarkable what uh, can be done when people have a mind to do it. And so I wanted to start with recognizing the founders of our company who 61 years ago uh, had, the, had the audacity to start a business. And it's, it began unusually, and I think it's sometimes helpful to recognize what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So my wife's mother, uh, Lee Mitchell, was faced with a, a serious problem raising her children, her three children, one of which was my wife, uh, because her husband was uh, in pipeline construction and was uh, all over the country but never at home for his kids and, and then they had to change schools all the time. And so uh, the three children, including my wife, were getting to be a little wild. So she, the mother had to figure out a solution for this problem and the solution was the only way I can get Jim home was to start a business. And so she thought about what she could make and eventually she came up with a slipper that she was sure that housewives would love. So she got her husband, now this is a salesmanship issue, she got her husband to leave driving D7 cats to make ladies slippers. Now that is a, that is a wonderful feat of uh, accomplishment. And so they launched off to sell these slippers and, I, and that was 61 years ago and that's the slippers and we still, believe it or not, we still make them today, although in smaller quantities. But it turned out to be a product for which there was no known need. And that's, <laughs> and that's a problem, you know. So, you know, you've heard that thing, Houston, we have a problem, you know. Well, yeah. Jim, honey, we have a problem, you know. So, so they, de they demonstrated in their life what it, what it means to be an entrepreneur. And a, a lot of that is endurance and tenacity and enduring faith that there's, there's got to be something coming around the corner. The only place where these slippers were uh, used was along the interstate highways where uh, busloads of senior citizens would uh, roll into the rest plazas and they would see these soft slippers and they'd say, oh, my feet are killing me, I would love to buy a pair of those. And so that's the only place that they found a need. But one of the rack jobbers who would supply these slippers said uh, to his wife, was sharing these, and his wife was a nurse and she said, do you suppose that these would be any good in the hospital? We have a lot of problems with slips and falls in the hospital, and I wonder if they would be any good for that application. So they went to one hospital show, and the nurses fell in love with them, and one particular hospital in Corpus Christi, Texas, wrote the most wonderful statement, which became the cry, the charge, for the company, and that was, these slippers are a real miracle in reducing the incidence of slips and falls in hospitals. And that was the beginning. So it took seven years, and for all of you who want to be entrepreneurs, it took seven years to find that place and a lot of endurance. Most people would have hung it up, but they didn't. And so I think if I look at and think about legacies, in addition, and I'll talk about the, what I would call the major legacy that Lee and Jim Mitchell gave to Carol and myself and, and all of us uh, in a minute. But I think the, the legacy of, of a lesson learned is that tenacity and persistence and determination amount to a great deal in being in the business, world of business. So, but what I'm really grateful to them for as their legacy, I've got to stop going around with my speaker here, uh, is the name of the company. Uh, as mentioned, I was, a pub, uh, I was house counsel for a public company in Chicago, and uh, I was watching what was going on in this little teeny business in Ohio, but our, our company, we had 1,800 employees, and we were all over the world, and my job was to be troubleshooter for this company, and I loved that job. I really loved it, but what I didn't like was that we were a public company. In a sense, 
And we had sold our soul to the devil, which is the analysts, because they are always about the bottom line. And here is this little company that they named their company Principal. And that was such an attraction to me. And as we talked about it more with them, uh, Carol's mom was quite a conceptual thinker and, and a wonderful, creative, out-of-the-box thinker. And she said, I named the company Principal Business Enterprises because I was thinking of words. Principal was the most, that was the beginning point. But I wanted to, to, we were going to be a business, and I was thinking about Principal Business Enterprise. I looked up the word enterprise in the dictionary and it said a daring adventure. And so she, she thought that fit, that she and her husband were starting a daring business adventure based on principle. And that had a lot of appeal to me. And so I thank them for their gift to all of us of that sense of running a business based on principle. So I think that as a beginning point, I thank them for their example of the seven lean years. It was followed by seven fat years. Anybody get that parallel there? <laughs> Elsewhere, it starts with fat years and lean years follow, but we started with the lean years. Uh, but then the company began to, to move forward until they ran into a challenge with, with a, a catastrophe at the business. Uh, and, and that was that the plant that was in Waterville collapsed. Uh, it was an old building and a heavy snow, winter snow, collapsed a, a good portion of that. And they didn't know what to do, and they put out a call for help. I'm a troubleshooter. I, I, I said that I would, and Carol, with a lot of push from Carol, said, you got to help mom and dad, you know. So I came over and began with the company, and it has been a, a terrific adventure ever since. And, and I want all those young people to hold that thought of adventure, because your life and business is an adventure, and you want to make the very most of it. And, and thus began our career working together and figuring out where could we go. For me, it was very vitally important that we have go beyond just the name to get a sense of mission about what we are. And so early on, we settled on sort of a catchphrase, which I found very inspiring, and that was that we make products for the security, comfort, and dignity of hospital patients. That felt good to me. And so we, we began to build the business and, be, and expand the business into other areas. And we, we, we thought, we're doing well in the United States. We built a plant in Belgium to service the European market. And the, and the uh, medical professionals over there said, if you really care about dignity, then you ought to look at what you can do about adult incontinence. Now, this is not usually a lunchtime topic that you talk about. <laughs> and I have to tell the story about my son Pete in school who, you know, at the first day of school, he's like in first grade, and the teacher says, okay, what do your, what do your daddies do? And he shoots up his hand, and the teacher says, Pete, what, what does your daddy do? And he, he says, he makes blabber control products. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been in the blabber control business for some time. But the, what, we, what we learned was the terrible uh, situation that involved people who have because of either congenital birth disorders or because of uh, uh, neurogenic disorders uh, or, or perhaps a physical injury are not able to control their bladder. And it's, it's such a stigma that uh, they, they really don't go out. Life is kind of over. And what they said is the, the problem that they have with the products that are available today is once you're wet, you stay wet. Uh, you smell bad, you get urinary tract infections, you uh, quite often will have uh, incontinence-related falls. Life basically is over. So go back to the United States and figure out a better way. And so that began the search for a better solution. The audiences we serve are those, and I hope that you will think about this because we, we are doing very well in some spaces, but we are very frustrated by our inability to get out to all the people who desperately need what we have to offer. And I would point to a couple of groups. We know that there's the, the situation dealing with Alzheimer's disease and any of the dementias is so challenging, so challenging for the caregiver because they, they define that life as isolation, frustration, and exhaustion. And a big part of that is just they get worn out. And it doesn't have to happen. So our business and our mission as we move forward out of for the security, comfort, and dignity of hospital patients is to, to begin to address 
a different sense of mission about being united in uplifting and uh, ennobling and enriching the lives of those we serve. And so if I had a dream, which I have a lot of dreams, that it would be that we could reach every person in the state of Ohio who is a caregiver for somebody with a dementia and provide them with a solution that would help them make their life more, more pleasant and make it, take it from being a curse to be the caregiver to a blessing to be the caregiver. So I think I'm going to stop here and let Steve talk a little bit, and then we'll go back and forth a little bit. So, but I, I love what we do. Um, I love, I was thinking about if I, if I asked one of the people on the shop floor, what should I say today? They would say, share one of the testimonies that Alan Clifford, who is, oh, I need to, I need to pay tribute to my wife, Carol, who without her, I'm not here, you know? That's, uh, so she's really vitally important. And all of our senior leadership uh, at, and, and other associates in the company, the company doesn't operate without the people. It is not Chuck. And I think we, I want to make that very clear. This is uh, the gains that we've made over the years are as a result of the creative thinking that have been brought to, the, brought to bear on the challenges by the likes of you know, Joe Matthews and Alan Clifford and Mike Kirby and, and countless others that make it happen. But this morning at Alan's <coughs> production meeting, they always start with a testimony. And they, they didn't start with this one, but this is one that I shared today. This says, since I was 18, I have suffered from nighttime incontinence due to a spinal injury. It steadily grew worse over time to the point where the product I was using just didn't hold enough. Each morning I'd wake up to, to discover the diaper had leaked and my bed was wet. Then I found tranquility and never looked back. Thank you for helping me get my life back. No more wet beds. I think that essentially is our business, is helping people get their lives back. And, and we'll talk a little bit more on some other things, but Steve, take it away. Thanks, Chuck. How do you follow that? <laughs> the, the health and wellness of people, and I think we, we touch it in a way with the food. We're on the other end. If you look at what Chuck's company and uh, what they do for people, we're the beginning where you're putting it in your mouth. And <laughs> that's pretty important. It's sustenance. Bob, I know you like I was that. a catcher when I was playing baseball. I guess I'm still in that business. A... And be, before, our, before I get started, I just want to say is uh, my wife couldn't be with me here today. She's in the healthcare profession. She's a physical therapist and doing her job today. But I brought my mother, who's at the table there. And she was a big part of not only me, but a big part of the operation if we go back a number of different years. And she worked a lifetime there as a mother and uh, right there next to my father. But kind of like Chuck, it's antiquity. antiquity. You look at the pictures that were up there when they were introducing me. You know that guy, that old looking guy wasn't me when they were introducing me. Uh, that was our great grandfather. So you're looking at a, fifth, a fourth generation here and we have fifth generation that's started to work for the business and various capacities. One's in IT, a couple are in production, and uh, really just trying to get their feet wet. But, but I think it's extremely important when you look at legacy on how we got started. And he was, uh, our great-grandfather was actually a beer meister. He was a brewmaster. And what an interesting business that would be in today. And I'm not sure I'd want to be there unless I was a microbrew. But um, that's, that's turned over just like a lot of the food industry. But if you look at, he got started and was working for a gentleman in Buffalo, New York. So they weren't even from the Toledo area. He was a Swiss immigrant, married a Swiss, young Swiss gal. And grandpa and, and grandma Lena, Lena great grandma, they um, were operating the business for this gentleman that owned it. And then this act came along, which was called the Volstead Act. And then some of you older folks in the room know exactly what that is, prohibition. Um, completely dynamically changed his business overnight, and he uh, was faced with some tough choices. He had already started buying that business from uh, the gentleman. He was going to buy him out because he was the plant manager and, and really running the show. But the, the gentleman was kind enough, and this is a great example of generosity that started right there. He gave him his money back and said, you, you have a young family. At that time, my grandfather probably couldn't have been 10 or 11 years old, and then he had two younger sisters. He said, you have a young family to take care of, 
and I'm going to give you your money back, and you need to go find a real job. Because they, they tried food and some other things that just didn't work. But you can imagine uh, the number of companies that were producing beer or alcohol or some sort. So they picked up, moved to this area, a blessing. Um, Northwest Ohio, Toledo. Why? Because he had a couple brothers here that were in business. And one of them was in the greenhouse business, and another one was in the coal business. They were selling coal to a number of different manufacturers around the area. And I believe another one, another brother, older brother, these were all older brothers, was uh, actually had a bar. So he, his life changed a little bit too. So he started working for them as you would as a family. They bring him in, but not enough to support these families. So he bought a piece of land where we are now, uh, where the homestead is. And actually, that's where I grew up. Our mother finally was able to move out of there. I think my sophomore year in college, um, she had every truck driver. You can imagine people stopping and knocking on the door because it was literally right in front of the place. But he bought that 60 acres, knew nothing about farming. But if we go back to you know, some of the values and uh, you know, our company and what we are today, what always with our folks, and, and many of these are unspoken. They've been carried through the organization without the formal purpose and value statements. Because kind of that's just how the Herzl's are. You just, you just do it. You're resilient. You're resourceful. And it was always focused on quality. And I think that that's quality of the individual, not quality, just quality of the products. But he started growing agricultural crops because he heard the soil was good. He didn't know anything about it. He hired a local guy, retired guy to help him. Started peddling some vegetables. And his, and his wife, at least the story goes, Lena, said, Okay, let's make some kraut. We got a lot of cabbage here. So he started making sauerkraut. And if you know anything about food or processes, sauerkraut is similar to making beer. So we, I do have a brother, by the way, older brother that's an engineer for our company, and he's, he's a master brewer himself. He's done a tremendous job of making beer again, pulling out some of those old recipes. But I think um, making that sauerkraut and then peddling around, and there was a number of different merchants in the area, it was extremely high quality. It's back to that quality. And, and my understanding that he passed along that you, you can, if the, if the stakes are the same and you're equal to your competitor, they've got, they always have a better price, as Dad would always say, but quality sells in the, in, in the end. And I think his, his quality was because his sanitary practices, the cleanliness, the little details that he took care of. You can imagine these old wooden barrels that you're filling with cabbage, shredded cabbage. They have every smell uh, that you can pick up because the wood just absorbs it, just like the wine industry. Well, he packed a real nice quality crowd. And then quickly, the merchant says, what about a good canned tomato? So that's how the, the tomatoes got started. And um, with him, my grandfather was a, a mechanical, they called him a mechanical genius. He, he really, as a young person, could build about anything. And that's where that resourcefulness came in, as we talked about as a group today with our, you know, in, in our management team, in, t in today, in this world today that we live in, resourcefulness always rises up there because we take something and uh, one person we were working through one time called us barn cobblers. Well, that's, that's good, that's fair. We take what's a, what we have and make something a little bit better out of it. So the tomatoes, and, and that's what you see today, you saw the brand, and some of those old pictures were important because another Value, which is a, the hub of our legacy, is innovation. And I, don't, I know we wouldn't be here today if it, it wasn't on the minds of the people, that, uh, the families, the people that have been with us so long. They, they all have that knack of innovating, looking, how can we do it better? What can we do next? And that's really required in the food industry because you're simply taking a crop, converting it, and then putting it in some value-added form. And there's a lot of people that can do that. But um, we found that the resourcefulness and the innovation and some of the technologies, some of these advances that we did, you can see that bridged really tough years. And, and, and we look at where we are today, um, this, this innovation and resourcefulness and, and who we are has really led to um, you know, employee base and folks that really understand uh, the markets that we're in and where we're going. So, um, we'll talk a little bit more about other legacies that come out of that, and I'll, I'll probably share a little bit about our, um, some of our values and how that's been the basis of our legacy. Okay, so 
I thought might be useful to think about, and particularly again for the younger folks, to think about a legacy and think about a foundation that takes you to a legacy. I think so often we think about legacy as sort of end of life kind of things, but I think legacy is an everyday thing. And, and you might, at the end of your day, think, what was my legacy today? What, did, what difference did I, what did I deliver to my colleagues or to the community that makes the difference? And that's, that's a practical application of legacy. But for, for us, as, just as we had that initial slogan that helped motivate me, and, and I think motivates all, all of our associates, as we moved into a new technology, it, we, we saw the need to strengthen our foundation and continually update the foundation of principles that the company operates on. And so we, we fashioned what we call our mission statement. And we, for every associate in the company, we, we reduce our annual business plan to a little card like this so that they, they know exactly what our goals are for the year, what the mission is, what our vision statement is, and, and the, that gets them all in the game. And so the mission statement, which I'll share, is it's the mission of Principal Industries to be an example of the right idea of business that operates and prospers from a principled base and tend towards uplifting, enlightening, and enriching the lives of those it serves, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That is so helpful because it's not just about us. It's about those we serve. It's about our community. It's about the world, the industry we serve. What are we doing to uplift and enlighten and enrich those? And what, have we seized every opportunity to make that difference? I think making a difference is that daily legacy that we all can do in, a, in big ways and small ways. We also saw, as we were cross-questioned about this area of absorbency, what, where were we going to position the company? And I think as young people, you think about your positioning and your mission. And I encourage you to think about your personal mission statement right today. Think of yourself as an enterprise of one. You work for yourself. You are the marketing team. You are operations. You are all that the enterprise is involved. And your catalog sheet is your resume. It is the legacy that you have given, what you have done along, the, along your path. We decided that our position in, in terms of vision for the, the products that we make would be to be the best in the world at developing and marketing innovative, high-performance niche products while providing exceptional customer service. I think we go back, Steve and I share this so much in common. The world did not need another commodity producer. That's what you find at mass retail. There are products that are made and positioned in terms of quality and in terms of price for the, the, the middle of the bell-shaped curve. That wasn't where we wanted to be. That wasn't what was needed. We would never be the low-cost producer. So we felt that what, and what that uh, hospital uh, administrator in Europe said to us is, go do, make the products that people who have really challenging situations can use. And so that's where we position ourselves, and we, we aspire to be the best in the world. And when we find people sneaking up on us, then we, we take it up another notch. Uh, and that makes all the difference. And it makes our products highly, highly valued by care professionals and long-term care and in hospitals and in home care settings, all of those places. So I'm very grateful for, for that statement. But it's also a reminder of what we call the triple bottom line. So whereas before I was only concerned about, in the public company, about the bottom line, because that's what the analysts were really interested in, here we have two other primary interests as well. And they are co-equal in importance for our enterprise. So we obviously have to be a sustainable enterprise. That means we have to be profitable. But we, we also uh, we want to make sure that, as an enterprise, that we are creating an exceptional workplace experience for our associates. So that seems like that's the bargain today. And always it should be the bargain, is to, to think about the people you work with every day, not to squeeze the last ounce of energy out of them, but to create a multiplier effect. If they have a good working experience, they're going to go back to their homes and have a better home life. They're going to go into their communities and do better things in their communities. Uh, and then we obviously, the third leg of that stool is to make a difference, to make products that change lives. 
and we've been very blessed in that regard uh, that we, our products are very highly uh, prized in, in the markets that we serve, the major markets, and we've been very fortunate uh, to uh, expand. It took a long time. We talk about road bumps and, uh, and when you're trying to get to someplace, but we determined that our America's veterans really needed much better care than they were receiving in the care facilities. And so it took us eight years of no, 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 we can't, you gotta go through these hoops, you gotta do all this stuff. But finally we have, we have through persistence of, us, of our sales team and, and specific really excellent sales leaders, we, have, we are now in about 40 or 50% of all the VA medical centers in the country. And we're beginning to reach out to those veterans who are at home, but changing their lives so that they, that we, in a way, are saying thank you for what you've done for our country and for all of us who are in this room who have been protected by their efforts. So, back to you, Steve. Yeah, I want to. I want to go back to community. I think our company's been really going in the direction of our company is as far as a commu community. We're pretty low key in regards to blowing our horn in our our activity within the community as far as support, but. Um, generosity is part of that core value we were talking about in stewardship. We, uh, I just saw a document that came across my desk the other day and it was from Feed the Children. I don't know if people are familiar with that group. It's a charitable organization that started by a guy out of Oklahoma City and we started providing them with food products, shelf stable. I'm talking about canned sauces, the basics, um, so they could deliver it to people in need. And that their mission is um, to really try to eradicate childhood hunger. And so I'm back to Chuck on the other end of what you do. It's, at first you gotta have food to go in your mouth. You, you've gotta have sustenance to live, to, to, have, to be able to think, to be able to take the next step and have hope. And our company has been fortunate, you know, we're, we're blessed with this local climate and soil and, and these, this grower base that we have which is over 30 different family farms that deliver this product to us and then all we do is convert it and stabilize it so we can feed you and all the rest of the folks through the rest of the year. Well, there's a report in that said that 16% of the homes in the United, there's 16% of the homes in the United States with children under in childhood age, they call it six years or under, that don't have sufficient food. I think we all hear that, but these guys are right on the ground floor and working with these individuals, and it's a, an astounding number, and it happens in every community. It's happening in our community as well. But we, they had also put in that report that our company had contributed 700,000 pounds of product last year. And I, it shocked me, because then I looked, and they also had 2016. It said 720,000. And I thought, okay, boy, I should be watching the budget a little bit closer and what we're donating here. But, but it's our responsibility, it's who we are, and it's just a matter of fact. They had a need, and the other thing that they do is they hit these poverty zones all over the country, including here in our backyard. They work very closely with the food banks in Toledo, but they also um, respond to crisis, and I think we had enough crisis in the last couple of years between natural disasters, floods, fires, tornadoes, you name it, and they had a need, and, and we responded, but that's, um, that goes back to the beginning, and you know, we were we were always taught that you know you, you help them, and especially when you're blessed and it comes through your uh, this crop that comes through you. We fortunately had a big enough crop that we could do it, and we even had a year where our growers it was such a surplus, they jumped in and says, look, we'll donate the extra tomatoes. We talked to our couple of our suppliers on cans. They gave a significant discount on the cans, and then we donated the rest to just be able to pack product. Uh, to send to people in need. And I think that was during the, the big hurricane that was down in Louisiana. But that, that is back to the entire organization, the people in the community, and we can't do this without the support. And, and I think I, it's by who you are and how you demonstrate who you are with your suppliers, with your bankers, which we have a couple in the room today, and um, your, your customers. They dictate everything. If it isn't it isn't of the sufficient quality, it isn't um, of the right price, 
we don't have a business. And, and the same goes with our employees. They, they keep us honest as individuals, as leaders, and supervisors and family members. They remind us every day who's in charge. So I, I wanted to share that a little bit, that little story, because I think it means a lot to going back to those beginnings, um, being resilient, and then coming back, and then serving those around us. One principle uh, I think that is really essential to leaders and, and all of us is developing our listening capability. I think lots of people like to talk all the time, um, but listening, and that's one of the things that I think has been essential. Had we not listened to the people in Europe, we would not be what, doing what we're doing. And consistently, I found it seems to me a basic principle is that the really, really, really great ideas come from the shop floor or from your customers. And they'll tell you what it's like wearing your product or, or they'll tell you what life is like. And I'll give you a couple examples. I was walking through our shop one day and one of the fellows stopped me and he said, I've been watching our waste stream, the stuff that we're sending in the dumpster to the landfill. And, and he said, I lived in Zambia for a number of years and if, if this was going, to, if this had happened in Zambia, the next day that would be somebody's house. And he said, I think you have value that you're throwing away. So I said, okay, that's really cool. You're on the committee, we're gonna examine this. And so uh, they, a little task team was pulled together and, uh, and indeed, we were throwing a, a lot of value away. And early on, it, oh, I should have shut that off, shouldn't I? <laughs> My cell phone. Hold on one second, this must be. Something important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could put that right there. Maybe that's God calling, who knows? <laughs> So anyway, we, we formed this little task team, and, it, and almost immediately it started adding a couple thousand dollars a month to our bottom line. Today, it's more than twenty or thirty thousand dollars every single month. It's waste that is being turned into into revenue, uh, a revenue stream for the company. So, number one, listen, in, probe, and and engage with the people that you're with, you know, with colleagues or people who report to you or whatever else, and the customer. And the best example I have of that is a customer called me one day and she said, uh, what do you have for the really large person, like the Native American women that I serve? And I said, so what, what does large look like to you? you know? And she said, well, start with a 90 inch waist. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, anyway, through a couple trials and error, we, we've, we came up with a product that was designed and, and perfect for that audience. And by just following and doing a really good job Today we sell 50,000 cases a month of that product, thanks to listening to, thanks to Alan Clifford and the, and the development team and the, and the other people who could take the idea and convert it into a reality that made a difference of all those people who they know when they need to go, but they just can't get there in time, often is the case. So that I, I love the idea that nobody has a corner on all the right ideas, and you'll find them coming from the most wonderful places that you never suspected that they exist. So I think that's a, that would be for young people, is just listen, listen, listen. Develop those listening skills. Yeah, I'll echo that a little bit, because we, we see so many times that you, know, you, you get consultants to help you with strategic planning, and it's got this nice little booklet, and we always like to say, let's try to condense it to a page or two. But it's good stuff. But what, we, what you see often, and most of the people that are in business and here, and managers, you've been down that path, is it always becomes, so many times it becomes something so different. And like Chuck was saying, is listening to customers, and sometimes the customers are in your face and say, we really like your products, but you better change the package. Uh, and we had an example where we were putting things in large food service cans, which is what the restaurants, healthcare, schools would use, and they said, we're using it as an ingredient in manufacturing. This is a multinational company. They said, you either get it in 55 gallon drums or totes or we're not gonna be buying from you. And this is, you know, this was a, at that time, was a, probably a million and a half dollar customer, which is quite significant about 30, 40 years ago. I think it was about 30 years ago. But back to that innovation, it, it was a necessity to drive a new technology. And there was some talk about this aseptic processing. And I had an uncle and a couple, of his colleagues that developed it, and we start putting tomatoes in the bags. And today, it's by far the largest growing part of our business. It's an ingredient because now people, the way we eat and how we've changed our eating habits, 
We buy very little. We, you know, we're in a very, much, very, very mature industry of uh, retail cans on the shelf, and people are buying at restaurants or kiosks, um, convenience stores. There's really quite high quality food being found everywhere, so we've had to adapt to this. But this ingredient side has been been the engine for growth. And the second thing for young people, when you think about it and say, okay, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to manage. What we've seen is um, that I saw the company do a long time ago and have really appreciated is there was always investment going on when things were good. There was always a, taking a chance and sometimes you'd, I'd question my uncle and, and here I am in sales saying, why are we screwing around changing our peeling process when we have a good peeling process, we get good yields out of it, we have extremely good costs and you'd say because there might be a better way. And, Sure enough, that was another major innovation and stepped in. We saved another 10, 12% on our peeling process because we made that investment at that time. So there was taking, you know, as a young person, you say, oh, you're taking margin away from the bottom line and potentially paying people with those dollars. But that those, when you have the dollars when you're doing well means so much for 10 to 20 years down the road when those developments become your new process and your new products and your new markets. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of that. Those growth engines don't last very long, and especially in today's industry, those windows close very fast. So a couple of good lessons learned that we certainly appreciate as it, with a strong balance sheet that's been just a tenant of our company and allowing us to do some of these things. So one thing I wanted to share is in the healthcare industry that we serve, it's a time of great change. Uh, it turns out that our technology and absorbency is, has a lot of ramifications and opportunities in, in the space of wound care because it, the, this ability to control moisture is a strength. And one of these days you'll see a sign on our building, we're wrestling with this, what do you say on the side of your building that tells people what it is you do? But one of the things is we are leaders in moisture management technology and that has a bearing in, in wound care and, and we say we're trying, working to create the ideal microclimate for wound healing or wound remediation. But I would share with you that it's been a very difficult road to hoe. We know our products really work. It's a very difficult to break through on, and these are those, the speed bumps or the, the challenges that come with being innovative, is the resistance to change is enormous. Uh, the following old patterns of, of purchasing or acquisition, old clinical practices, is, is really challenging to break through. We believe in our business that we can be transformational. We feel very certain that we can drive enormous waste out of healthcare today. But it's, and, and fortunately we're going through a, a trend towards what they call capitated payments, which means we're only going to pay this amount for treating this wound or this situation. We think that's has some good in it because it says you buy for performance. It's like buying tomatoes that are not, not good or whatever. You get what you pay for. Our products are typically on a uh, item by item basis are a little more expensive than the competitive products, but they deliver so much more that they, at, at the end, there's enormous savings. In this room, we all need to demand outcomes. We all need to demand outcomes in healthcare. Don't be satisfied if you, whatever your issue is, it's lingering with you for a long time. Don't be satisfied with it. Raise cane. Ask for better products. Ask for better services. This is what we want to do. This is what we aspire to do as a company is to change behaviors, change the way things are done. Uh, because it isn't good enough. We're, I think, 17th in the world in terms of the level of healthcare that we're delivering in this country. That's shameful. We should be doing better. I get off my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, the, <clears throat> when you talk about the waste side, I, th I think we look at the, in, in the same fashion, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen a harvester, but they're mechanically, tomatoes are mechanically harvested. And so many agricultural commodities today are mechanically harvested because of our labor situation. And there's just not enough people. It's extremely hard work, but there's, a, tremendous amount of fruit that's left behind because we're picking and there's electronic sorting and it's kicking out green and blemishes and you name it. 
and it lands on the ground. And if you were to drive by, you'd say, boy, there's a lot of good food, or there's a lot of something that looks like tomatoes, but they're green and orange and breakers. What can we do with that? And I think we've challenged our organization to always look at to look at that in, in our chef and in our innovation kitchen and, and playing around with fire roasting green tomatoes and turning those green tomatoes into a vegetable component in, in a salsa or into a sauce or uh, you know as a replacement for peppers because peppers are a pretty expensive commodity and most peppers are hand picked. So those kind of activities are important as when we look on the wayside. Another big thing that we we look at is on the, we have a compost operation and you, and I would tell everyone here is good luck if you're going to get in the compost business because it's there's so much regulation there and there's there's the the paperwork the cost and the constant inspections and the um, the regulatory can drive a good individual buggy but we needed to do it. We did it for the reasons of we had a waste stream coming out of our facilities that was, when it wasn't so much about saving the cost of the waste stream, it was not putting that waste stream back on the land um, and not getting value out of it. So we're taking it to a compost operation. We're bringing in manure from local family farms and helping them with their issue of, uh, you know, what do we do with our manure on livestock operations and then also mixing it with leaves, um, sticks from local communities, and even food waste. So and today, you know, can't, many board meetings are looking at you saying, boy, we, we lost how much on this compost? But it's the right thing. And it's, and, and it's really, it took Uncle Joe a while to get it across to the rest of us, but it's back to this is the right thing to do, and it takes our waste stream, and, it take, and we take that product from our facilities when we're peeling tomatoes and we have the sword outs and we turn this into a fertilizer, a natural fertilizer, because we do have some organic tomato ground that, and organic grain crops that we grow that we can put that compost on. So um, another example of not everything's profitable, and for young people, there'll be decisions like that, no matter who you work for, or where you, what you do, if you are an entrepreneur and you go on to your own business, there's going to be decisions like that you have to make, but you, you lean back on what trucks business is, principle, and, and your principles, and who are you, and, and why do you do what you do, and what brings you joy, and what brings value to those around you. Yeah, I love that, Steve. Uh, the, the thought of, of you do it because it's right, and so often I think uh, we're tempted to do something because we think it'll make other people do this or that, you know, some motive. So it's always about checking your motive, but, and, and so if you find yourself saying that, well, I'm going to do this because I, uh, this, this way they'll like me or whatever else, I think if, you, if we can, as human beings, get to the point where we do it because it's the right thing to do, it's the thing that has integrity, that has virtue in it, then that's a really good place to be. And I, I wanted one other thing I wanted to share, and that is that every day we should all strive to find a little awe in our life. And that's possible right where you are in your business, in your schooling, your academic work. Uh, they had a, a section in the uh, Blade a couple years ago, and I, I, I was touched by it. And, and thinking about, don't, don't wait till the end of your life to be thinking about the things that are awesome, but look around every day to identify that which is awe-inspiring. It may be just the birds chirping or whatever else. But I want to share with you one thing that was really a lot of fun for us. Uh, as a company, we work to give uh, contribute to uh, local activities that we're involved with um, and we set up a donor advice fund for our workforce so that they can make grants to organizations that they're involved with or that they believe in and that's been just really wonderful. But one day I read an article about and it, it touched me because it was involving America's veterans and it was a story about a women's prison in Colorado that was the women prisoners were training rescue dogs that would be given to uh, soldiers with PTSD. I was, that really touched me. And so I asked Jane Curry to hunt down the details on that. Jane is, works for us, and she did. And so in the end, Carol and I went to the women's prison. We met with all the prisoners there. They told us about their dogs and the experience that they, what, what it meant in their lives it was transformational for their lives. Imagine this, a prisoner who has no life finds purpose in training a dog 
for an outstanding future activity. A dog who's destined for euthanasia and, and a, a soldier with PTSD who gets a big portion of his life back. It was so awesome. It was so fun. That, uh, and I don't say this to toot our horn, but we decided that this would be a way that we could pay it forward for the veterans that we were serving in the, in the VA hospital and the VA system. And so for a year, we underwrote that program for a year. So we know that 40 dogs were being trained for, to go to veterans with PTSD. The most really interesting one was that they told about a, a, a veteran who uh, was in Afghanistan and had, uh, would, go, was on the, would go into dark buildings to make sure the coast was clear. When he came back, he was so traumatized by that experience that he could never, never go out at night because he could never come back to a dark house. So he received a dog that would go into the house, turn on the lights, check all the rooms, and come out and report that the coast is clear. So he got his life back. To me, that's awesome. Now, that, that, we didn't fund that. That was before our time. But I just think th there are big ways and little ways that we all can make a difference in the, in the lives of those who are around us. And I think in the end, if our businesses aren't doing things like that, then we're not really uh, optimizing the value that our businesses can bring to our communities. Anything else, Steve? I would, um, for, for young people, one thing that I try to share with them is, um, Arika, you were at our table and I was talking to you a little bit about, and she's a student, um, first generation college student, I understand. And nice, nice story, but I would encourage people like you is to keep your, keep your peripheral vision open. You had a plan, you knew that you wanted to go to school, you knew you wanted to get a degree, and there's a number of different people that touched your life in that process, but look for the opportunities. Sometimes we get so I, I see, especially as I got a son going through the process right now, trying to pick a university, and there's so many people around them that say, well, I'm gonna major in business, I'm gonna go on and get my MBA, and then I'm gonna work for this company. It's, that's great to have a plan like that, but it doesn't usually work that way. And so many times we miss what we, we, we miss because our blinders are on or we're so focused there's opportunity on your left and right, and it's the people you meet, it's the people you touch or who touch you, and you lose that chance that it could have taken your life in a little bit different direction. So I always be mindful that there's opportunities out there that we should take advantage of, and don't leave it to chance. I think it so often, and one of the schools we visited, they said it was and I don't know if it's the same at Lourdes, but they said 60% of the, and this was a business school, said 60% come in with their major, and another 70% of them change within the second semester. So it really does happen. So I would just end maybe here. I want to thank my son, who is going to help carry on our venture. Uh, he has taught me so much. Uh, they learn a lot in school today. I've discovered that. <laughs> That's the right thing to say here. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but uh, we're very blessed. And with all our senior leadership in our company and all the associates that are in our business, I'm most grateful. Most grateful to Lord's College for what I, I have enjoyed. Every once in a while they ask me to come and speak to the business class up there. It's a hoot. They are so fun, you know, and, uh, and so alive uh, with energy so uh, engage with young people. Young people, you engage with us old fogies too, you know, so it works both ways. But it's a, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here, and um, thank you so much. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for uh, our two speakers? How do you distinguish courageous tenacity from stupid stubbornness? <laughs> <laughs> It's, you know, you have to look and examine the issues and say, what, what is the foundation? Is it a principled foundation or is it personal sense? Is it personal will? It, 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 what, what's behind it? You know, I think that's, to me, that's, maybe somebody else has some other ideas, but that's what I see. Thank you very much. And we're again very thankful for you coming today as a part of Lords.
and a part of what we're excited about, growing people for the future and leaving a legacy when they do so. So thank you very much.